Hey everyone, I'm Adam Harrington, and today I'm looking for wild plants and mushrooms that I can forage and use to create a wild vegetable broth. So it's late autumn and the air is definitely cooler here in western Pennsylvania. And one of the best things that we could do during the colder months of the year with wild plants and mushrooms that we forage is create a rich, warm, hearty vegetable broth. So whenever we think of traditional vegetable broths, maybe we think of adding members of the celery family, like carrots, celery, and parsley. Maybe we add members of the allium family, like garlic and onions. Maybe we add some mints, like sage, rosemary, and thyme. Now I don't think we're gonna find those particular species in these woods, but I think we're going to find some good substitutes. So what I'm specifically looking for today are wild members of the celery family, wild allium species, and maybe even some wild mints. We'll see if we can find some wild mushrooms. And then once we forage those ingredients, we're gonna to return to the kitchen and create a wild vegetable broth. So thanks for tuning in. Let's go see what we can find. So right off the bat, this is a plant I know I want to include in the wild vegetable broth because it's very aromatic. This is a member of the Apiaceae family or the celery family. This one is anise root, Osmorrhiza longestylis. Now this plant, when crushed, smells like anise or black licorice. So it's pretty easy to positively identify if you use your nose or even if you taste it, but you gotta positively identify it before you do taste it. So as I mentioned, this belongs to the celery family. APACA, that's a very large family of plants. Worldwide, there are over 400 genera, over 3,500 species. We're familiar with lots because we eat lots of them. Carrot, celery, dill, parsley, parsnip, cilantro, and the list goes on and on and on. However, there are some species in this family that are deadly toxic. So even though there are a lot of wild edible members in the celery family, you don't wanna eat water hemlock, you do not wanna eat poison hemlock because these are deadly poisonous plants in that family. So you have to be very mindful when harvesting members of the APACA family. But as I said, once you go through the key identifying characteristics for this plant and you smell it, and it should smell like anise or black licorice, you won't really confuse it for anything else. So Osmoriza longestylis, that's the Latin name. Its genus name, Osmoriza, means odorous root. But the root isn't the only thing that smells, the foliage smells as well. And longestylis refers to the long styles of this plant and styles are part of the female reproductive organ, and more specifically, it's the part of the pistil that connects the stigma to the ovary. Now, anise root is native to North America, though it seems to grow mostly in Eastern North America. Where I live in Pennsylvania, this plant is very common, so even though it is a native plant, and it's one to be very mindful of when harvesting, I feel good knowing that its numbers are very strong in places like this. So anise root is an herbaceous perennial that can grow to be two and a half feet tall when mature. Its leaves are compound and almost fern-like, which is very characteristic for members of the celery family. Anise root grows in rich, moist woods, typically in shady areas, and its key feature is its fragrance. Rub the leaves of anise root or scratch the root and you will smell anise or black licorice. Very few plants smell like this, so it is a key identifying feature. Now there is one plant that very closely resembles Osmoriza longestylis, and that is Sweet Sicily. And that's another member of the Osmoriza genus. That's why they look alike. Now that one, Osmoriza claytonii, should smell less like anise or less like black licorice, and its styles are shorter. But you won't see that until the plants are flowering and producing fruits. But that one is edible and you can use that one just like this. It probably just won't provide as much flavor and it won't smell as strongly as anise or black licorice. So once I've positively identified this and I can smell the anise black licorice, I'm going to harvest some of this and throw it into the vegetable broth. I'm going to harvest it just like this, stem and all, because I'm going to strain out the greens after making the vegetable broth. So there's some here, there's some scattered about here. That's typically how I find it. I don't really see it in dense patches or dense clusters. It's usually scattered about in moist woods, typically in shady areas. I'm just gonna harvest some of this, throw it in my basket and look for the next plant. So here's a nice handful of Osmoriza longestylis anise root that I harvested right over there. And this one tastes really good. 
tastes similar to how it smells. So very anisey. Now, not too far away from that original patch, I found another member of the APACA family. Edible member, an herbaceous member. This one is Canadian Honewort, Cryptotenia canadensis. So Cryptotenia, what does that mean? Well, it means hidden oil tubes, essentially, or hidden tenia. So tenias are oil tubes found in members of the celery family. In the case of Honewort, these oil tubes are hidden. So this one is like a mild cross between parsley and celery leaf. That's what I get whenever I taste it. If you crush the foliage, that's how it should smell as well. But of course, don't taste it until you can positively identify it. Now, as with many members of the APACA family, one of the best ways to positively identify them is when they are flowering. They're not flowering right now. This one is not flowering right now, neither is honewort. They typically flower during the summer months. So what I encourage you to do is visit these plants during the summer months, take note of their characteristics while they're flowering, look at the leaves, then revisit those plants later in the year when they're not flowering. That way you can feel confident in your identification. So honewort, Cryptotenia canadensis, as a mature plant, is typically taller than anise root, and it can grow to be up to three feet tall. This time of year, mid-autumn, it lies pretty low to the forest floor. As a member of the celery family, it has compound leaves, and these compound leaves are trifoliate, so they contain three leaflets, which are serrated or toothed and broad. So they're not as fern-like as you would see in anise root. Now here's a key feature. Look at the foliage, and you'll see that the leaflets are typically broadly lobed. And this is something that I always look for when identifying honewort, these lobed, serrated leaflets. They almost resemble mittens. And remember, these leaflets come in threes. Not twos, not fives, but threes. And of course, you want to crush the foliage and smell it. And once you can positively identify this plant, taste it, and note this very herbaceous parsley, celery leaf flavor. The honewort grows throughout North America. It's mostly common in Eastern North America, and it's native to Eastern North America. It is very common where I live, and there's a very healthy population in these particular woods. So what I'm going to do is harvest these and throw them into that vegetable broth. I'm going to strain it out afterwards, like I will with the other greens. So I'm going to harvest the leaves, and I'm going to harvest the stalks as well. There's a bunch scattered throughout here. I'll probably even harvest some more anise root while I'm at it. Okay, so right now in the basket, I have anise root and honewort, two members of the celery family, which will definitely add a lot of flavor to the vegetable broth. I'm really excited because right now I just discovered a species in the Lamiaceae family, or the mint family. And this one, when crushed, smells like a cross between minty lavender or earl grey tea. So this will definitely intensify the flavor of the vegetable broth. So this is a wild Monarda species, and Monarda species are commonly known as bee balm or wild bergamot. And Monarda is named after Nicolas Monardes, who is a Spanish botanist in North America, and he actually wrote a reference book on the medicinal value of North American native plants in 1571. Now this particular Monarda species, like many other members of the mint family, contains square stems and oppositely arranged leaves. These leaves are serrated or toothed, and they're longer than they are wide. They're also slightly hairy. This particular Monarda species is growing in a very moist habitat. Where I'm standing right now, I can tell that the ground is saturated with water. Many, but not all, Monarda species do tend to grow in moist woods along stream banks and floodplains. Like many of the other plants that we talked about today, this species can be identified based on its smell and taste. As I mentioned before, this Monarda plant has a minty lavender slash earl grey tea flavor. So it'll definitely make a great addition to the broth. Now because this Monarda species is quite potent, probably not going to harvest a whole lot. A little bit can go a long way. So I'm probably only gonna harvest maybe five or six stems, including the leaves as well. Put that in the basket, and I'll chop that up finely before I put it into the vegetable broth. So this basket now has within it two members of the celery family and then that new addition that we just added, a member of the mint family or the Monarda species. So what else are we missing? Well, how about an allium species? This one right here. This is wild garlic. That's what I'll be calling it. Some people call it field garlic. Some people call it crow garlic. Some people call it wild onions. This one's Allium vineale. It's a non-native Allium species here in North America. So Allium is a very large genus, 
hundreds of species in the genus, many of which we're familiar with. Cultivated onions, cultivated garlic, chives, leeks, scallions, and in my opinion, no vegetable stock or vegetable broth would be complete without the addition of at least one Allium species. This is the one that we'll be adding to the mix, Allium vineale. Now this one is extremely easy to identify just based on its smell. Now I can't smell it right now, it doesn't smell like much, but once you crush the plant, any part of the plant, it should smell strongly of garlic, it's that sulfurous smell. Now wild garlic almost looks like grass, and it can grow to be between one to three feet tall. The leaves are semi-erect, they can bend, and each leaf is round in its cross section. So if you rip a leaf or bite into it, look at its cross section and notice that it's round, not flat. And another key feature of this plant is that its bulbs have a papery outer coating that can be removed. Now I'm going to harvest all of this right here. I'm going to harvest the leaves and I'm going to harvest the bulbs as well. Now because I'm harvesting the subterranean portions, I got to be mindful of dirt. There's no dirt in this basket right now. Everything that I harvested was an aerial portion and it's really, really clean. There's no debris on any of this and I want to keep it that way. Once I pull this whole thing up though, I'm going to get some dirt into the basket if I put it in there. What I'm going to do is put this, all of this, into this plastic bag, then I'm going to put it into the basket. But I'm going to put all of this into the soup after it's clean. Okay, so the basket's getting full with plants. We found two members of the celery family, a member of the mint family, a member of the allium family. I told you that I'm going to look for mushrooms. Now, I've been looking for mushrooms. I don't really see too many. It's getting quite cold here in Pennsylvania, so we're not seeing many edible species these days, but we're seeing some of the cold weather species like these right here. So this is the brick cap mushroom, probably not my first choice for a vegetable broth. I'm going to throw it in there because it does have a nice mushroomy flavor. And so this belongs to the genus Hyphaloma. Now worldwide there are about 30 species in the Hyphaloma genus distributed from temperate to tropical areas. You'll find Hyphaloma species decomposing wood. You'll find Hyphaloma species on live trees. You also find them among soil and mosses in wet areas. Now, this particular species, as I mentioned, is a cold weather species, so it tends to grow autumn through winter. And I gotta tell you, brick caps are not beginner's mushrooms. They're not a beginner's mushroom. Definitely consult various field guides before consuming these mushrooms, and go out with people who know something about brick cap mushrooms before you decide to harvest them because there are some species that do resemble brick cap mushrooms and those species can be toxic, sometimes deadly toxic. So key features of this mushroom include its dry brick red cap with a paler margin and an underside comprised of closely spaced gills that are directly attached to the stalk. These gills are whitish at first, then they become darker, almost grayish purple with age as the spores mature. Sometimes you'll see a faint ring zone around the apex of the stem. And the spore print of this mushroom is purple brown. So this particular species, Hyphaloma lateridium, is a white rot decomposer, mainly of hardwood trees, but you also see it occasionally on conifer trees. And as I said, tends to grow during the colder months of the year. I'm not going to harvest too many of these. I got a nice handful right here. There's some right here. And honestly, they're just going to come off really, really easily because they're frozen to the wood. So I don't even need a knife. Kind of just break right off. And I can see that the gills they were cream colored when younger, but they're turning that purplish brownish color because the spores are maturing. So these are definitely brick cap mushrooms. They will thaw out when I bring them home. I'll chop them up and throw them into the vegetable broth. So before I head back to the kitchen, I thought I'd add one more plant to the mix, and it's one of my favorite plants. I talk about it a lot. This is stinging nettle, Urtica dioica. This will add a nice darker green color to the vegetable broth. A lot of vitamins, minerals, phytonutrients. I'm really excited to find this and throw this into the mix. So stinging nettle tends to grow spring, summer, fall through early winter. During the warmest parts of the year, this plant can be quite formidable because of its sting. And there are trichomes, botanically known as trichomes, or hairs up and down the stalk on the leaves. They have a silica tip, and whenever you brush up against those trichomes, the silica tip breaks, and into you is injected a chemical cocktail full of various neurotransmitters and acids. But this time of year, this plant is relatively harmless. Stinging nettle is in the Urticaceae family. Worldwide, there are around 50 genera and around 2,600 species. So it's quite a large family of plants. This one, Urtica dioica, is fairly easy to identify beyond its stinging properties. The leaves of this plant are oppositely arranged and they're serrated. 
so the margin of each leaf has sharply pointed teeth. Stinging nettle grows in dense colonies connected by underground rhizomes, and it's usually found in sunny openings, frequently along streams, creeks, and wet places, and also in fields and disturbed areas like empty lots. So I'm going to harvest a bunch of these aerial portions, including the stem, because again, I'm going to strain everything out at the end. Because they're not really stinging me right now, I feel comfortable not harvesting with gloves. But if you're getting stung, feel free to use gloves, feel free to use scissors. Just gonna use my fingers today. Okay, so my basket's getting full with lots of plants and some mushrooms that I'll soon incorporate into the wild vegetable broth. Now the point of this video wasn't to tell you that you need to forage these exact species in these exact proportions to make your wild vegetable broth. You can do whatever you'd like based on what you have available, based on where you live. I realize that you might not live where I live and have access to the same plants and mushrooms, and that's perfectly fine, but you probably do have wild APACA species where you live, some wild mints and wild allium species, so feel free to experiment and see what works best for you. So having said that, let's go head to the kitchen. Okay, now we're in the kitchen and we're going to make a vegetable broth using mostly the plants and mushrooms that we foraged today. Keep in mind that I'm not following any particular recipe, so I won't really be measuring out anything. Rather, I'm just going to eyeball the ingredients and taste the broth periodically as it's cooking. Now, I already made sure that everything is clean because I don't want to add soil and extraneous debris to the pot. So if your ingredients are dirty, definitely rinse them first. So we've got anise root, Osmorrhiza longestylis, a very aromatic herb in the celery family. We've got Canadian honewort, Cryptotenia canadensis, another aromatic herb in the celery family. We've got a Monarda species, which smells and tastes like a cross between minty lavender and earl grey tea. We've got wild garlic, also known as field garlic or wild onions. This is Allium vineale. And as you can see, I clean the bulbs and remove the papery outer skins. We've got stinging nettle, Urtica dioica, which is not stinging me right now, and even if it did sting, the hot water would definitely remove any signs of the sting. And we have brick cap mushrooms, Hyphaloma lateridium, mostly just the caps with a little bit of stems in there as well. Now to increase the surface area and to create the most flavorful broth, I'm going to chop all the plants and mushrooms into smaller pieces. You don't have to chop them into extremely small pieces, that you probably don't want to throw everything in whole either. Chop them up, including the mushrooms, and throw everything into the pot. Once the plants and mushrooms are in the pot, I'm going to season the mix with some good quality sea salt, and I'll add some pepper as well. Instead of adding crushed pepper, I'm actually going to add a few peppercorns whole. And remember, everything is going to be strained out at the end. Once the salt and pepper are added, I'm now ready to add water. Wild harvested spring water is my water of choice, so I'm going to add enough spring water to cover all the vegetables and mushrooms. Here I'm adding about a half gallon. After stirring everything around, I'll turn the heat up on the stove, cover the pot with a lid, and bring the liquid up to a simmering temperature, so about 185 degrees Fahrenheit. I don't want a rapid boil because I'll be cooking this for around two hours, and a rapid boil is probably unnecessary. After a few minutes, I'll check on the broth to see if it's at a simmering temperature. The vegetables and mushrooms might hang around the top of the liquid, so I'll stir it around for a bit. Then I'll put the lid back on, but I won't cover the pot all the way. I'll leave it open a little because I want to reduce the liquid and concentrate it, essentially making it more flavorful. Periodically, I'll check on the broth to see how things are looking and how they're tasting. And I encourage you to taste the broth as you're making it, because you may find that perhaps after only an hour, it's done. In this case, the broth was not done after an hour, and I decided to keep it simmering for another 45 minutes to an hour. After another hour, so about two hours total, I decided to check on it again. As you can see, the liquid is much darker, and it has been reduced down, and this time it tasted perfect. I'll turn off the heat and allow the broth to cool down before transferring the final product to a jar. In this recipe, I decided to strain out the plants and mushrooms because I included a lot of extra fibrous material, mostly the stems. If you want to keep all your materials in there, that's fine as well. After two hours of cooking though, you're mostly left with a lot of fiber, which can be composted. So I started with about a half gallon of water and I reduced everything down to about a pint of concentrated broth. 
Of course, you don't have to use these proportions. Give it a shot yourself and see what works best for you. So now you're probably wondering, how does it taste? Wow. That's amazingly good. That's one of the best vegetable broths I've ever consumed in my entire life. But of course, I might be biased. But it's almost like you could tell that every single plant that I forage in, that mushroom is definitely in here. Not too strong, no one flavor dominates, but it's just right. You know, it's a really cold day of filming, really cold day here in Western Pennsylvania. So this warm beverage is definitely going to hit the spot and I'm probably going to actually cook some potatoes with it tonight. I think that's what I'm going to do. And I encourage you to explore your land for edible plants, medicinal plants, and mushrooms the ones that are edible or medicinal, and see if you can make some vegetable broths out of it. Again, you don't have to use the same exact species that I use, nor the proportions. See what works best for you. Thanks so much for watching this video. Thanks so much for joining me today on the foraging excursion. Hope you learned something. Hope you enjoyed it. If you enjoyed this video, I encourage you to subscribe to the Learn Your Land YouTube channel. You can head on over to learnyourland.com, sign up for the email newsletter. We can stay in touch that way. You can also follow me on social media at Learn Your Land. Thanks again. Happy foraging. Thank you.